So this week was a travel week for me. And usually when I travel, I have, I call it hotel time in the evenings. Typically on a Tuesday night, I try and think about what it is that I'll deliver my sermon on. This week, multiple things came to mind. My MO is picking a one-word topic. So I thought, perhaps I could choose ten words. And that's what today's sermon is on. Ten words. The words that came to mind from sermons of the past are temptation, accountability, self-control, respect, responsibility, Discipline, forgiveness, patience, obedience, and commitment. Today I'm going to take these words and dissect them a little bit, but I'm going to progressively bundle them together in a statement to see how they all work together for the benefit of our lives and how Jesus used these words in his life. Let's take temptation first. Temptation, typically, it's an enticement to do evil. The first thing is that temptation could be used in a way of testing us. To test our integrity of our commitment to God. The second more popular method or use of temptation talks about enticing us towards the deliberate act of evil against God or somebody else. Now, this week when I was traveling in a foreign country, one night I decided to check the channels. There was only one station in English. That was a news station. And all the others were in a foreign language. And going through the TV stations, it's probably at 10, 11 o'clock at night, there was one channel that many people could very easily be tempted to stop and look at because it didn't matter what the language was. It was a girl dancing on a pole. You don't need to know the language to see that. I could have been very easily tempted to just kind of like lock my sights, but I knew God would see me and it wasn't pleasing to him and it wasn't the right thing to do. So after a pause for a few seconds, click. I was able to re re refuse that temptation and, and overcome that resistance that you know, Satan would want me to just, hey, it's on TV. Perfectly fine to watch. Because that's what he wants us to think. So let me be clear that God does not attempt humans to do evil. And in James chapter 1 verses 12 through 15, Linda read us that scripture earlier today. God gives us the resources necessary to resist temptation. And we heard that scripture read to us today from 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. You can go home and reference those two areas of scripture. That he does not tempt us. Satan does. And he gives us what is necessary to resist that temptation. Because it's always so easy to just give in. When Jesus was on this earth, he was repeatedly tempted during his own ministry. In Luke chapter 4 and verse 13, and also in Mark chapter 8 and verse 11, talks about these temptations. I'll read to you both of those passages. From Luke it says, And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him, until an opportune time. Jesus didn't give in to the devil. And in Mark it says, the Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. His greatest temptation is when Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Straight away. Boom. And he was at his weakest point when that all occurred. Can you imagine yourself 40 days in the desert? 
nothing to eat, nothing to drink. And somebody came along and said, if you do this, then I'll give you that. The old if then. Would your strength be strong enough to resist that kind of temptation? That's what I think about when I'm tempted, the model of Jesus. How weak, how beaten down he was after that duration of time. Somebody would dangle something in front of you. We would all, I believe, be very eager to jump on and say, yeah, <laughs> I so much want relief from what I'm doing right now. Temptation is a course that Satan takes. The attack by Satan always starts with the Lord. It continues to lure us today. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Now, Satan is a great spin master. So he convinced Eve to believe that God was not good if he withheld anything from them. He caused doubt in her mind as to the one tree, as to why it was off limits. Satan said to her, as he's spinning it around, if God is so good, why would he, why would he withhold this from you? But since he has held back the fruit, of a single tree, they obviously can't be that good. So his plan was to cause the doubt. Satan causes doubt in our mind. Caused doubt with Eve. So she said, she gave in to the temptation and ate of the forbidden fruit. We have to think about every time we're tempted, stop and pause. Is this the right thing or the wrong thing to do? Because when we're tempted to do the wrong thing, Satan is very happy about it. But it's not pleasing to God, and there always will be a consequence to pay for that action. The next word in my list was accountability. And accountability is pretty self-explanatory. It's the state of being accountable. It's an obligation or a willingness to accept responsibility to account for your actions. Now, having an accountability partner will help you to keep your focus and not give in to temptation. Temptations that we are all faced with. We can ask God to be our accountability partner. If the Holy Spirit's with us, He sees us, He hears us. But it's always good to have a friend, I suggest, of the same sex, to be your accountability partner. Women have things that women need to talk to women about, and guys have things that guy needs to talk about. And it's hard to open up to people. It's hard to call somebody and say, you know what, I'm having a problem here. Our dear missionary friend, Cindy, who's off around the other side of the world, had called Linda and I, because she was getting addicted when she was in this country to watching television, the same show over and over and over, I think it was on a Sunday night. And she had asked us to be an accountability partner for her, to challenge her about that habit that she had when she should have been studying the foreign language for where she was going. And she knew she was being tempted to be pulled away from what she should be doing to prepare herself for her missionary work. And she had asked several people. She's quite a model to, uh, and had different people to help her be accountable for different things. She had an accountability partner, uh, female, and she said to the gal, at 11.30 when I'm out on a date, call me on my cell phone to make sure I'm on my way home. Mm -hmm. So she wouldn't fall into the trap of sexual misbehavior. She had a girlfriend call her up. She said, I'd call her out ahead and say, I'm going on a date. Call me by 11.30. Make sure I'm on my way home. 
So having an accountability partner can help us overcome those temptations of the flesh that all we all have. The other word on my list was self-control. Self-control is a restraint over your own impulses, emotions, desires. Because we can have our emotions and desires and impulses overcome us. We lose our self-control. But self-control is essentially a fruit of the Spirit. In Galatians chapter 5 and verses 22 to 23, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. So in that verse, it talks about so many different things, one of which is self-control. So we as believers, if we drink the fruit of the Spirit, if we have ourselves filled with the Spirit, there is a verse in there that talks about that also. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13, it says, For in one Spirit we are all baptized in one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves, or free, and all are made to drink of one spirit. So if we drink of the spirit, we are thought of by the world to be drunk with the spirit. And indeed, that's the only time I won't be drunk. I won't be drunk on the Holy Spirit, be filled with the Holy Spirit, not be filled with the wine or the liquor that other people like to get drunk on. Doesn't say you can't drink that. The Bible does say not to be a drunkard on it. Get drunk with the Holy Spirit. Have that natural feeling that the Holy Spirit is going to give you. Because it's with the Holy Spirit, we're going to be able to exercise self-control. With the Holy Spirit, if you're in a situation where you're tempted to pound down a few drinks, if you have the Holy Spirit with you, you can exercise the self-control and stop at one or two. Then you are demonstrating by your actions to others around you that it is not a good thing in God's eyes to become a drunkard. You've relied on the drunkenness of the Holy Spirit in you to give you the self-control, to resist the temptation of doing the wrong thing. If we exercise self-control and we hold ourselves accountable, we will be stronger to resist temptation. Now the next three words have real significant meaning to myself and my family. Respect, responsibility, and discipline. These are three words that I pounded into my daughter's head from a very early age, of ones you could really understand, probably about three years old, we talked about respect, responsibility, and discipline. And she did something wrong, I'd say, give me the three words. What are the three words, Liz? And she's up for a visit this week, and I saw her this morning. I said, Liz, I'm preaching today on ten words. What are the three words that I brought you up with? And she still knew the three words. She was able to recite them to me. So respect, really, it, we need to consider others. Respect others. Respect others' things. In Philippians chapter 2 and verses 3 to 5, it says, Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only at his own interests, but also the interests of others. Have this mind amongst yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. So the example of Christ, instead of concentrating on self, we as believers should be concerned with the interests of others, with the interests of their faith. There's a lot of people that go to different churches. Satan will cause us to 
argue with them over certain theological beliefs. No. What we need to do is respect them for the fact that they do go to church and find a common ground to, to reach with them. The word respect comes in. Respect the fact that they are doing something. Not to succumb to temptation and lose your self-control and cause conflict. Responsibility is the other word. And that pretty much is it's the quality or the state of being responsible. You say you're going to do it, do it. You don't, you're not being responsible. How many people do you know today that you can rely upon because you know that they're 100% responsible? Being responsible for your actions. Responsibility ties into being accountable. Talks about being trustworthy. In Matthew chapter 12 and verse 37, it says, For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. And that still holds true today. Parents, we have a responsibility to our children. We have a responsibility to raise our children up in the proper way under the eyes of God. We don't take that responsibility. We all have a consequence to pay in terms of how our children turn out. But we never lose that responsibility. It's never too late. Even with my own daughter, she still does things that I don't particularly care for. But I feel responsible to point that out to her. She might not like it, okay? But I still feel responsible. And of course, discipline. Discipline is really taking control and being obedient. If you're disciplined, you're obedient. If you're disciplined, you have self-control. If you're disciplined, you will conduct yourself in a proper manner. You're going to behave the right way. Discipline is also a rule or a system of rules governing the conduct or an activity. There are certain disciplines you must in encounter in the rules of sports. You've got to discipline yourself to follow that rule, to play the game properly. Otherwise, you're out of it. They kick you out. Have you ever listened to God's voice to help you discipline yourself? In Deuteronomy, in chapter 4, and verse 36, it says, Out of heaven he let you hear his voice, that he might discipline you. And on earth he let you see his great fire, and you heard his words out of the midst of the fire. Do you hear the voice of God today? Are we disciplined enough to pick up that Bible on a daily basis and read and hear the Word of God through His words to us? Unfortunately, God has been taken out of the schools. Discipline disappeared. God is being taken out of our society and our government. Discipline is disappearing. I have become increasingly concerned with the lack of discipline in the homes today, in this country, in our schools, and in our society. What has happened to discipline? I think that every young man should go into the military because the military still instills an element of discipline. You will get up at 6 o'clock. There is no, you will do this, you will do that. You have to discipline yourself to follow those rules, because if you don't, in the military there are still consequences that they will put you through. That type of discipline is, needs to be brought back, bringing God back into our schools, God back into our society. Because when God is removed, Satan is taking over. So with discipline, our responsibilities become easier and we realize our respect for God, it requires our self-control and our accountability so we can be stronger to resist temptation. See how all those words work together? Now here's one that we all lack from time to time, that's patience. 
had to be very patient this week myself with flight delays and things of that nature and remaining calm. Patience is the power to endure without complaining when something is difficult or disagreeable. It took a lot of patience to this week. My flights were delayed, and I saw a lot of people lose their patience with the people at the counter. An ugly thing. But because I had patience, and when it was my turn to approach the counter, they did something different for me. I was put in a better hotel. I was given more food vouchers. And I was actually given a better seat on the next flight. Pays to have patience. The patience of God is a purposeful concession of space and time. It is an opportunity given for us to exercise. In 2 Peter verses 3 to or 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9 it says the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness but is patience towards you not wishing that any should perish but that all should reach repentance so the Lord promised us something we might think it's slow coming about but he's patient with us to come to him to repent our sinful ways Jesus has plenty of patience with us. We should also have patience with others and not lose our patience. His return seems long in coming. People have been talking about it for centuries. But because God wants people to be saved, as many as possible, he will come in his time. We can't predict it. 2 Peter chapter 3, and verse 9 the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. He will keep it. Now, if we lose our patience, we have no patience, then how can we have discipline and responsibility? How can we have respect for God? How can we have self-control and accountability? And how can we resist temptation if we lose our patience? Forgiveness. Pretty self-explanatory. It's the act of forgiving, not holding a grudge. The Bible records human sinfulness and God's eagerness to forgive. God is eager to forgive us. Why can't we be more like God and forgive others? We will hope it goes away, disappears, we're afraid to confront and just humble ourselves a little bit and forgive. In Matthew chapter 18, 20 through 21, this is one everybody's heard, then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I to forgive him? As many as seven times. And Jesus said, do not say I did not say to you seven times, but 70 times seven. In reality, it's, it's an endless number of times. They thought back then, well, I give him seven chances and that's it. Then I'm going to lose my patience and I'm not going to be forgiving anymore. We need to have the patience to continue to be able to forgive others who have repeatedly done the same offense against us. If we don't forgive others, how do we expect God to forgive us? So, with forgiveness, we should have patience with others and ourselves. We should have the discipline and the responsibility to move on. We should have the respect for God and His forgiveness for our own sins. We should have self-control and accountability so we can resist the temptation to hold a grudge. Obedience. And that is pretty, again, self-explanatory. It's the act of obeying. The quality or the state of being obedient. Christ was obedient 
Jesus Christ was obedient to God the Father. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 19, For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. And here is where Paul draws a parallel between Adam and Jesus. Which role model do you want to be like? Do you want to be like Adam? Or do you want to be like Jesus? As Christians, we are called to be obedient in our faith. Obedient to Christ. Obedient to the gospel. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 5, it says, Through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all nations. Do we obey God all the time? Are we obedient? Or do we obey when it's convenient for us? When it's convenient for us, that means we're being tempted in other directions. So we're losing all the quality of how these words work together. So with obedience, we can be forgiving. We can have the patience we need. We can have the discipline and responsibility we need. We can have the respect self-control and accountability and will be better equipped to resist the temptation of our sinful ways. Then of course the last word is commitment. When you get married you're committing yourselves to each other under the eyes of God. So commitment is a state of being obligated. You're committing you're saying, I will do this. In Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 25, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very self? Really, in these words, Jesus is setting before us our choice, the choice of commitment. Jesus was spelling out the ultimate impact of that choice on the human personality. If we choose to follow Jesus in daily commitment to him, we will save our lives. We will become the self that we potentially are through the presence of God within us. So now let me tie all these words together in one last statement. God the Father made a commitment for our salvation by sending His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. His commitment was, provided, was to provide us with the free gift of salvation so that we may obtain eternal life. Jesus was obedient to the Father. He is, a, he, is a forgiving, he is forgiving of our sins. He has the patience to wait for us. When he was on this earth, he exercised great discipline to take on the human nature, and he made it his responsibility to carry out the will of the Father, and he respected the Father. He demonstrated self-control like no other man could demonstrate. He will hold us accountable for our sins, so let us not continue to give in to the temptation of sin and accept Jesus Christ and ask Him to forgive us. So I took a little bit of time to think about how I'm going to tie all these words together. But if you think about these ten words, how they all have an impact one upon the other to help us through our lives. My hope and prayer this week is that you can remember at least three of them, maybe all of them, and incorporate those into your daily living under the eyes of God's watch.